Hello and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club number six. I'm Professor Sheldon. I teach Anatomy and Physiology at Mount Hood Community College in Gresham, Oregon. Today I'd like to take a little closer look at endothelial cells and a recent publication about cardiovascular disease. You can read this editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was published at the same time as the full-length article that covered a novel treatment for heart disease namely using an antibody raised against a signaling molecule used by white blood cells that triggers inflammation. The patients in this study were already at a high risk for heart disease and were currently on two types of medication to lower their risk. The first type were beta blockers. These are drugs that combine to beta adrenergic receptors and prevent epinephrine and norepinephrine from binding. This lowers sympathetic tone and allows parasympathetic tone to predominate. Acetylcholine, released from parasympathetic postganglionic neurons, would bind to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors on the heart, and this helps to hyperpolarize the SA node, lowering heart rate, which can help to lower blood pressure. The second class of drug that patients were already taking were statins. These drugs lower blood cholesterol levels. The liver can synthesize cholesterol and package it up along with fatty acids to be sent to target tissues to be used or stored for later. Because cholesterol and fatty acids do not dissolve in water, they must first be packaged up into a macromolecule called a low density lipoprotein or an LDL. This large macromolecule can travel through the bloodstream to target tissues. Target tissues, on the other hand, can repackage cholesterol and fatty acids into a high-density lipoprotein to send them back to the liver for excretion. We typically think of LDLs as bad cholesterol and HDLs as good cholesterol. Because high levels of LDLs are correlated with a higher risk of death from heart disease, while higher levels of HDLs reduce that risk. However, it's not that simple, and that's where the third class of drug is going to come in next. The central hypothesis to the current publication was whether adding an anti-inflammatory drug to these two already good drugs would reduce the risk of death from heart disease even further. My first question was, don't we already use anti-inflammatories for the treatment of heart disease? For instance, aspirin. And the authors quickly pointed out that aspirin also has other effects, like antiplatelet effects, which make it a blood thinner as well as an anti-inflammatory. So they wanted to add a drug that was strictly anti-inflammatory. Before we go into that, let's review the inflammatory process. Inflammation occurs whenever any tissue is damaged in the human body. Let's use the skin as an example. Damage to the skin will first trigger hemostasis, or the formation of a blood clot. Release of inflammatory molecules from damaged cells will attract white blood cells to the area, which will release more inflammatory molecules. This can trigger local vasodilation and increased permeability of blood vessels so that fluid leaks into the area, causing swelling and redness. Some of these inflammatory molecules can also activate nociceptors, triggering pain. And increased blood flow can also increase the temperature of this area, leading to heat. And this helps speed up the healing process. These white blood cells will clean up the area and set the stage for our next event, which is regeneration. Fibroblasts can fill in the area with collagen, known as scar tissue. Epithelial cell division can be stimulated. And we can also increase angiogenesis, or the growth of new blood vessels, into the area, leading to a reddish scar. Many of these steps will occur in blood vessels when they get damaged. However, when the damage is long term, chronic inflammation is going to cause more problems than it solves. And that's where our anti-inflammatory drugs are going to be beneficial. A simple squamous epithelium lines all of our blood vessels as well as the heart. These cells are so special they get their own name called endothelium. For starters, they are derived from mesoderm, 
whereas most epithelial cells are either derived from ectoderm, such as the epidermis in the skin, or from endoderm, such as the epithelium that lines our digestive tract and respiratory tracts. These endothelial cells have a number of important jobs that make them a bit more special than your typical epithelium. They release a wide number of hormones. The most important today is nitric oxide. This is a local acting hormone which can trigger vasodilation, block inflammation, block apoptosis, and also block platelet adhesion. It's here that LDLs can be a problem. When LDLs were synthesized, they were released into the bloodstream from the liver, and they travel to target tissues for storage. To get to those tissues, the LDLs must leave the bloodstream, meaning they must squeeze between endothelial cells. This can happen without complication, and LDLs are absorbed by target tissues, and their components are stored for later use. However, Sometimes LDLs get trapped in the connective tissue underneath the endothelial cells. This is going to be the first step in an arterial plaque forming. Before that happens, though, we must first oxidize some of the fatty acids found within the LDL. It's the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the ones that have carbon-carbon double bonds in either a cis or a trans conformation, that are at a much higher risk for oxidation than the saturated fatty acids. This leads to the next step in plaque formation. Oxidized fatty acids can attract macrophages to the area, which will differentiate into foam cells, releasing a bunch of cytokines, triggering inflammation. Endothelial cells respond to these cytokines in a number of ways. They will increase expression of cell adhesion molecules that make them sticky to macrophages. This will attract more macrophages to the area to become foam cells, releasing more inflammatory molecules, which stimulate the endothelial cells to increase collagen production. This ultimately leads to the formation of a fibrous plaque in the area. Now you might wonder whether eating a bunch of antioxidants could have stopped this from happening in the first place by blocking the oxidation of LDLs. And to some extent, especially the lipophilic ones, that can be beneficial. Unfortunately, nitric oxide is also a free radical, and inhibiting it will only increase the formation of plaques in this area. That's why the authors went to an anti-inflammatory drug in the form of an antibody. Before we discuss that antibody, let's talk about why HDLs do not form plaques the way that LDLs do. HDLs exit the bloodstream in the liver, and the endothelial cells there are sinusoids, meaning there are gaps between the endothelial cells. This makes it easier for the HDLs to exit. In addition to that, HDLs are smaller than the LDLs, so they're less likely to get trapped. The drug canakinumab has already been approved by the FDA for the treatment of a couple of very rare genetic diseases, wherein kids are born with overactive immune systems. It is an antibody, meaning it's a protein, such as the one secreted by B cells. It has two heavy chains and two light chains, with two identical antigen binding domains. This one has been raised to bind to an interleukin molecule. Interleukins are signaling molecules released by white blood cells, which makes them a type of cytokine. One of the main jobs of T helper cells was to, when activated, release large numbers of cytokines to activate other white blood cells. Some cytokines can even be pyrogens activating the hypothalamus to trigger a fever. By inhibiting one specific interleukin, this antibody can reduce inflammation. And when administered to patients who are already taking two drugs to treat coronary artery disease, it helped reduce their risk of death from heart failure. Because this drug is currently only in use to treat some very rare genetic conditions, it is what's called an orphan drug. On top of that, as a biologic, these two factors make it very expensive. It's currently about a quarter of a million dollars per year for treatment. This raises a couple of questions. 
would the price come down if its usage was expanded to people with coronary artery disease, of which there are a large number. Keep in mind in the current study, it was only given to those people who had heart disease, were already taking two drugs, and also showed high levels of inflammation in the body. That was detected by looking at CRP levels in the bloodstream, our prime biomarker for inflammation. Secondly, we may ask whether there are cheaper and more effective anti-inflammatory drugs. The benefit of using this one is that it only had an anti-inflammatory effect. Unlike other drugs which can act as anti-inflammatories, this one does not have an antiplatelet or an anti-cholesterol effect as well, making the results simpler to interpret. That wraps up my journal club. If you'd like to learn more about this, you can read one of these fine publications. They should all be open access. Otherwise, I'll see you again in the next month or so. Thanks for watching.